All right. Uh, prior to the beginning of our meeting uh, today, we've got uh, some electeds that uh, just went through an election, and uh, we're going to swear them in. And um, so, without further ado, I'd like to first bring up Josh and Connie, and I'm going to uh, swear them in together at first, and then I'm going to turn it over to Indira, and she and her sister can come up and, and do that. All right. So if you two would, uh, after me, say, I, Connie Bozen. I, Connie Bozen. I, Josh Mandelbaum. I, Josh Mandelbaum. And then together, do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support. That I will support. That I will support. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution, the Constitution of the United, United States. States. And the Constitution of the State of Iowa. And the Constitution of the State of Iowa. And that I will faithfully and impartially. And that I will faithfully and impartially. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. Discharge all of the duties. Discharge all of the duties. Of the office of Josh for you, Ward Three Council Member. Of the office of Ward Three Council Member. And Connie to you of the office at large council member. Of the office at large council member. In the city of Des Moines, Iowa. In the city, the city of Des Moines, Iowa. Iowa as now or hereafter, as now or hereafter, required by law. Required by law. Thank you very much. You. You're now officially in. And now I'll ask uh, Indira to come up. And uh, <laughs> and if you want to move this into the room, you go on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, Indira Shoemaker. I, Indira Shoemaker. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support. That I will support. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Iowa. And the Constitution of the State of Iowa. And that I will faithfully and impartially. And that I will faithfully and impartially. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. Discharge all the duties. Discharge all the duties of the office of Ward 1 Council Member. Of the office of Ward 1 Council Member. In the city of Des Moines, Iowa. In the city of Des Moines, Iowa. As now or hereafter required by law. As now or hereafter required by law. I, Indira Shoemaker, on January 10th, 2022. I, Indira Shoemaker, on January 10th, 2022, make this oath to the people of, in, and about the city of Des Moines. Make this oath to the people of, in, and about the city of Des Moines. I swear to create and uphold methods, systems. I swear to create and uphold methods, systems, and efforts of self-determination and people's government. And efforts of self-determination and people's government. I swear to put the needs, rights, and autonomy of the people I swear to put the needs, rights, and autonomy of the people always above the acquisition of maintenance of capital. Always above the acquisition and maintenance of capital. <laughs> I swear to work towards true equity. I swear to work towards true equity by always uplifting the voices and the needs. By always uplifting the voices and the needs of the most marginalized in our communities of the most marginalized in our communities and always committing to solutions that work from the bottom up and always committing to solutions that work from the bottom up i swear to work toward the abolition of all forms and purveyors of oppression i swear to work towards the abolition of all forms and purveyors of oppression i swear to never consider myself greater in worth i swear to never consider myself greater in worth importance or right to power importance or right to power than any other person than any other person i will use my abilities to bring true power to the people i will use my abilities to bring true power to the people in all forms as no hierarchical institution ever could in all forms as no hierarchical institution ever could i swear to be a voice for the people in their interests i swear to be a voice for the people in their interests and in their needs and in their needs when the people are otherwise silenced or ignored. When the people are otherwise silenced or ignored. I swear to be accountable, transparent. 
I swear to be accountable, transparent, and to actively seek out and execute the will of the people. And to actively seek out and execute the will of the people. I acknowledge that my power is only as legitimate. I acknowledge that my power is only as legitimate as the will of the people to allow me to hold it. As the will of the people to allow me to hold it. If I should break my oath to the people, if I should break my oath to the people, or if for any other reason the people wish to reclaim this power, or if for any other reason the people wish to reclaim this power, my status shall be nullified, my status shall be nullified, and my power shall be subject to reclamation by the masses. And my power shall be subject to reclamation by the masses. <laughs> We also have a proclamation today, uh, and um, I would like to have anyone who is uh, representing and working with the uh, Human Trafficking Prevention to come up at this time, if you would please. Do you want to make any uh, statement um, prior to it, or do you want me to just read it? Okay. I will make this, uh, does anybody want to say anything before I start? Okay. Uh, our proclamation today reads as follows. The United States was founded upon the principle that all people are created with the inalienable right to freedom and added the 13th Amendment to the Constitution making slavery illegal. And whereas human trafficking and slavery in the U.S. is most often found in the form of forced labor and sex trafficking, which weakens our social fabric, increases violence in organized crime, and debases our humanity of those within our community. And whereas every business, community organization, faith community, family, and individual can make a difference by choosing products that are not made by forced labor, also by working to protect people from sexual exploitation and by becoming more aware of the problem and possible solutions. And whereas the Iowa Network Against Human Trafficking and Slavery has been working since 2005 to abolish all forms of human trafficking through education, volunteerism, advocacy, and collaboration. Now, therefore, I, the mayor of the city of Des Moines, on behalf of our city council and the residents of Des Moines, do hereby proclaim the month of January 2022 as Human Trafficking Prevention and Awareness Month and encourage everyone to become more informed on this growing problem, to be vigilant and report suspicious activity and to work towards solutions to end human trafficking in all of its forms. If you see something that does not look right, take action and call law enforcement or the National Human Trafficking Hotline at 1-888-373-7888. I want to thank you all for the work that you've done in this area, and, and let's give them a hand and let's keep it up. If you guys will stay up here, we're going to... Um, Take a quick photo, I think. Yeah? Yeah, if we can. Can we get this out of the way here for a second?
we're going to start our city council meeting in just a couple of minutes, but uh, I want to uh, quickly uh, go over some of the important information. Due to the increased community transmission of COVID-19 in Polk County, we have implemented a face covering requirement in city buildings. The requirement applies to both staff and visiting public and includes attendance at council meetings. If you do not have a face covering, one will be provided to you. Uh, the public is hereby notified that the city council will not tolerate disruption of our business meeting and persons wishing to attend this meeting are reminded of the following. We welcome germane comments from the public at the appropriate time, but this is a council business meeting and the council needs to conduct the people's business and council has rules that are validly adopted under Iowa law and those rules will be followed. Uh, anyone engaging in disruptive conduct in the council chambers or the great hall will result in being uh, disruptive and being ordered to leave the building and being denied readmittance for the remainder of the day. No person will be permitted to stand uh, in the council chamber during council sessions between the audience seats or on the seats and the council members except the persons addressing the council at the speaker's microphone and only after being recognized. All persons desiring to address the council may do so only when recognized, but the council reserves the right to limit the speaker's time and the order in which the speakers address the council. Under section 2-70, the city code it is illegal to interrupt any person who is addressing the council except by a council member and it is illegal to disrupt the council meeting. Everyone in attendance has First Amendment rights and any disruptive conduct by one person or a group impinges on the rights of others present so disruptive conduct will not be tolerated. Uh, if the person is disrupted and is being disruptive, the public speaking portion of the meeting may be moved to the next in-person meeting which is not disrupted. Those who disrupt the meeting will not be called on uh, during the meeting and will be ordered to leave the building and may be cited or arrested for disorderly conduct, trespass, or interfering with the good order of the meeting or other applicable charges. All right. It's five o'clock, so let's uh, begin our meeting, and I will ask the uh, clerk to please take roll. County. Here. Bozen. Here. Boss. Here. Shoemaker. Here. Westergaard. Here. Mandelbaum. Here. Gatto. Here. Your Honor, we have a quorum. All right. Uh, our first item on the agenda is uh, at the first meeting of the year, we generally uh, reappoint our city manager, our city attorney, the city clerk, the chief deputy city clerk, and deputy clerk and e the chief deputy city attorney deputy city attorneys and assistant attorneys could we have a motion to do the same i'll move approval of a a b c d and e all right it's been the moved appointment all right yep i i would just like to add that i think it would be my recommendation is is that the personnel committee that the reviews for these direct um, reports are done at, by the end of the first quarter. Okay, so we'll speed it up. Uh, yes, yeah, I idea. think that that's what we were going to try to get done this year too, much faster. Great. Yeah, I would request that we um, withdraw that motion and consider each separately. We have a motion that's on the table. Yes, I'm so asking that it be like withdrawn and we consider it separately. Your motion? I am not going to withdraw the motion. Okay. So um, I will ask everybody to vote. Joe? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Your Honor, that's six in favor, one no vote. Motion carries. Item two is a recommendation by myself for the appointment of Josh Mandelbaum as the mayor pro tem for the calendar year of 2022. I'll move item two. 
item for appointment of Josh Mandelbaum as the mayor. All right, it's been moved, and I'll ask everybody to vote, please. Joe? Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. Okay, item two is approving the agenda as presented and or as amended. I will say that uh, on the consent items, uh, which tonight are three through 43, that 4S has been withdrawn as the uh, inspections are incomplete. And um, that is a uh, inspection for uh, licenses and permits. Other than that, the uh, agenda is as it is presented. I'll move approval of the agenda, Mayor Connie. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Hearing none, item passes. Item three tonight is the um, approving the consent agenda tonight. That's item three through 43. Generally, these are uh, routine items and will be enacted by one vote um, without separate discussion unless someone, council member, or a member of the public requests an item to be removed to be considered separately. Uh, this evening, uh, item five, I will vote no. Uh, council member Shoemaker wishes to speak on 26, 34, 38, 39 and 43. I'll move approval of the uh, consent agenda. All right. Not consent agenda uh, has been moved and we need to have a vote. All right. uh, clerk, I will ask uh, quickly, are there any additional items that have been filed with you uh, to be pulled? Yes, Your Honor, I received one from Taylor Weber for number 26, number 38, and number 39. All right, I believe that our council member um, has pulled those and she will make appropriate comments on those. I believe the public was requesting to speak and I would ask for a vote. We need a motion then for the public to speak. I'll make a motion for the, to open all those items for the public to speak. Okay, so the uh, question here is 26, 38, and 39 are the ones that are requested. Uh, we've got a motion to uh, pass it with the ones that uh, uh, Member Shoemaker has pulled. Um, would you like to pass and then have the vote on public speaking? Is that how we're doing it? That would work. Okay. Okay, we'll go ahead and vote on that. Mayor, can you clarify the vote for me? Are we voting uh, to allow public speaking or are we voting uh, to just allow Council Member uh, Schumacher to, to speak? We're voting to pass the consent. We're, we're voting to pass the, the uh, agenda with uh, Council Member Schumacher um, speaking on the items as mentioned. Oh. I'll vote yes. We voting. <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought we were voting on. <laughs> Okay. No, no. Okay. She's going to speak on those items. And then but we're then going the, to vote. The secondary question after this vote would be whether or not we're going to allow items 26, 38, and 39. Uh, to I'll be make a motion to reconsider to that vote. So okay. oh. we can vote on it again to pass the consent agenda with the items pulled by council. Okay. okay. Carl, we're... So is this yes, vote yes to reconsider? Honor. Okay. This is a vote on, the, We're on gonna, the motion to reconsider. This is not a vote on the consent agenda. <laughs> okay. So the consent agenda has passed no. as it was originally read, yes. right? Yes. Okay, now. It's mo motion to reconsider the consent agenda. What are they doing? So who made the motion to pass the consent agenda last time? It was Bozen. Yes, I made the motion to pass the consent agenda as it was stated with the items. And then Carl accidentally voted no, so then we made a motion to reconsider, which was just approved. So now we just need a motion to consider the consent agenda. I just wanted to let you do it again if you wanted to. <coughs> the other way is Carl could have just clarified his vote with a yes. Well, that's what I was about to do, but I didn't get a chance. Then you wouldn't yeah, my bad. Motion to reconsider, Your Honor. Okay. So you can, Carl. Yes. 
vote was a yes on the consent agenda. Okay. That would have passed. Okay. And now you can take a, uh, now with the motion to allow the public to speak on those three items. Yes. Would be appropriate. I'll make a motion for that. Okay, there's a motion to allow additional input uh, public on 26, 38, and 39 as requested by uh, a speaker. They're not lit up yet. I ask everybody to vote on this one. Joe? Are you asking me if I'm going to allow the public to speak? Is that what we're voting on? Yes. On on 26, 38, and 39. I vote no. Okay. Mm -hmm. Your Honor, that's five yes, two no. Motion. Or five no, sorry. Two yes. All right. That moves us now as it is after five o'clock. We will come back to those items directly to hearings. Uh, again, before the hearing items, uh, for the hearings this evening, this evening we've got two zoning items, uh, 45 and 46. We have also one lease hearing and one public improvement hearing. As a reminder for the zoning items only, uh, which are 45 and 46, we will hear from the parties in interest first and then from the general public. The parties in interest for the zoning items only uh, include only the applicant for the rezoning and those people living within 250 feet of the property to be rezoned to whom the city has sent notices. After all the parties in interest have commented, we will open it up to any member of the public for germane comments. To aid in recognizing the parties in interest to zoning item to speak, I will ask everyone else to not step to the microphone unless they're a zoning applicant or live within that 250 feet and receive that mailed notice of the rezoning. Anyone who approaches the mic before their time will be compared to the mailing list. And if you're not on the list, you'll be considered disruptive and will not be recognized for the remainder of the meeting and will be required to leave the building. So please, please wait until I call on the general public for the zoning item or you will be, won't be called on for the remainder of the meeting meeting and required to leave the building. Uh, after all the parties in interest have been called upon, the general public comment uh, at not to exceed one minute per person to maximum of seven minutes will be called upon for germane public comment unless the hearing has ended sooner for failure to make germane public comment. For all the other items uh, this evening, any interested person may make germane comments at not to exceed one minute per person to a maximum of five minutes per hearing unless the hearing is ended sooner for a failure to make germane comments or when the comments cease. As a reminder, on the public improvement hearings, only comments as to the plans, the specifications, form of documents, and the engineer's estimate and the lowest bidder designation will be considered germane and all other comments will be considered non-germane unless the hearing is ended sooner for failure to make the germane public comments. So with that, let's quickly move to item 44. Item 44, our first hearing item is regarding items related to EMC lease agreement as follows. A is a public hearing on the proposition to authorize a lease with the employer's mutual casualty insurance company, EMC for the lease of real estate and park improvements at the location of 701 Wallace Street for use by the Parks and Recreation Department as a public park. Council Communication Number 22-003B is approving the form and authorizing the execution of the lease agreement. Again, um, Council, any uh, comments on this? If not, let's uh, open it up and ask if there's any germane comments from the general public uh, regarding the EMC lease to improve that uh, Sorry, property and turn it over to the uh, our uh, recreation department. Do we comment before or after public comment, generally? Uh, usually I ask before, you didn't say anything, so I went on and opened it up for the general public, but after they're done, you can make comment also. Okay. okay? 
Um, anybody in the public want to make any comment regarding? Yeah, we'll ask you to step to the microphone, please. Uh, yeah, push it, push it up. Tap it, see if it's working. Yeah, there you go. Still have the timer on it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was a joke. Uh, Taylor Weber, uh, Ward 3. Is that it? Is that all the info? Uh, so I, I love that we're going to be having a park downtown. That's awesome. We really need more uh, green space downtown. I do have a little bit of concern with, uh, you know, public-private partnerships are always really tricky in these sort of situations. So making sure we're paying rent looks like for 10 years that we're already uh, figuring out and then we're paying like $25,000 of upkeep every year uh, and then EMC is covering the rest. They get like naming rights and a bunch of other stuff for that. It seems like uh, we could maybe get a little less uh, yearly uh, budget going towards those items. The other thing that's a little bit concerning is they get to uh, provide additional security in our parks uh, as they want. I know that's something that uh, we, we use as talking points a lot of, of crime and stuff like that downtown, but like this is a park, a place for families, for kids and stuff like that, and talking about how we're gonna increase security in these areas, especially allowing a private corporation to decide what level of security uh, we want in a park, I think is a really bad move. Uh, so I would encourage us to reevaluate at the very least that aspect of it, but I also think we should be getting more if they're getting their, their name on a park. Here you go. Hello. Okay, Denver Ward Three. Um, yeah, I do have a concern with them providing their own security. Um, I understand that the city's like, oh, we have city parks, so we provide our own. But if EMC is providing additional security, what are they protecting people from? Are they protecting people from from houseless folks? Because I feel like the city could address that without doing security, um, with without doing like number 26, with the, the architecture that is anti-homeless, obviously. Um, so that is my concern. What do we need this extra security for? And is that something that we can work with that it's just the city that's doing security and we're not doing this additional security? It has to be on the mic stand. It's on. Hello. Hey, what's up? This is, uh, I'm Jalen, live in Ward 3. Um, yeah, I just want to echo the previous comments that have been made, especially about the security. I think that that's concerning, um, but I know that, you know, the Des Moines Police Department is also not a, a great option um, to be just around people in general. Um, I do have a question, though, about like accommodations that are going to be built at the park. Are there plans to build public restrooms um, at the park? Because I do know that like this location, especially, there's a need for public restrooms um, downtown, especially with houseless folks and other folks who are just down there. Um, so wondering if that's something that's planned to be included. And if not, I think um, it definitely should be planned. Thanks. All right. Mr. Mayor, if I may. Well, Indira's asked to speak first, and then I'll turn it over to you. Indira? All right. Um, so for this item, I am glad that EMC is wanting to invest in a park in downtown. I think that's a great idea. Um, I have a really serious problem with them providing additional security, um, especially since this is going to be a city park. Um, I don't see the need for private security. I think private security is a really dangerous standard to set. Um, there's no like p potential of a public accountability process with a private security force. Um, and so anything that happened there would be, you know, under the purview of like a business. So I would want to take that out um, to be able to vote yes on this. Um, I want to uplift the point about a public restroom. I think that that was a really good idea. I think that um, a big question I had in general was just, um, are the plans already made for the park? Do we get to see them and do we get to approve them? Or is that completely through EMC? Do they get to make their own plans? Um, and I also had um, concerns about uh, anti-homeless architecture specifically on benches um, in this park if they were going to be like, you know, like single seat benches or if they're going to be like the full regular as you would expect a bench that doesn't have a bar in the middle. So those are the kinds of concerns that I have with this. Okay. 
Josh? Uh, well, ben Page. Mike, uh, I know he's probably watching, and if he wants to come answer some of those questions, but I was going to uh, move this particular item, 44A and B. Uh, I appreciate the work that EMC has done. In this case, uh, this is private property that they do not plan on developing, and rather than let sit uh, and have no use or utilization, they've chosen to partner with us and to provide and donate the park materials um, and build the park. The arrangements that we've seen, uh, I think to the point on the lease payment, they are going to be continuing to pay property taxes on the land. The lease payment uh, reflects what the city is getting in property tax value, which is unusual to have a park where you get property tax on it. So that was, I believe, that specific negotiated term. Uh, overall, this is a very high value project for us. We are contributing maintenance dollars uh, and cap maintenance dollars at that. Uh, I have also asked about the restroom facilities. My understanding is that there are not restroom facilities here. Uh, the point is well taken that we do need to think about uh, restroom facilities in the downtown area. Uh, and Council Member Shoemaker, we might have an opportunity to do some of that uh, with our work on the Homeless Coordinating Council. I was talking with Angie Arthur earlier today about, about that uh, and the folks at Homeward and the Coordinating Council are thinking about some of those issues. So I think there will be opportunities outside of this particular proposal to think about the restroom issue in particular. So with that, I, Ben, if you can answer maybe any questions that have been raised about specifics of the design and where that is at. I know there are specifics that have been released and shared, but I, I am comfortable moving forward with 44A and 44B, and we'll make a motion along those lines. Mayor County, members of the Council, Ben Page, Mike you got to turn it on. There we go. Thank you. Mayor County, and the members of the Des Moines City Council, I'm Ben Page, Director of Parks and Recreation. I heard a couple comments, but there is a little delay, so I was walking through, so I'll try to get sure all the different questions. If I miss one, just please ask me to remind me. On security, uh, this park will be provided through Des Moines Police Department security, normal to all our parks. What normal for us is in our parks department is we don't have the police come through unless there's been some type of request or neighborhood request. And so EMC does have the ability to provide additional security of the grounds, but they have to enforce only chapter 74, the ordinance sections that apply to parks. So they can't write tickets. They have to call Des Moines Police Department if they have an incident and they have to report all incidents to Des Moines Police Department. The thought there is that way we have a record. So that's the security. There is no restroom plans right at this one. It's a small section of land. Uh, the council knows this for the last 10 years. We've been working on restrooms. We wrote a restroom policy you all approved. They're just pretty expensive, as we all know. Uh, but there is no budget for restrooms right now in this plan. The park has been designed. The way the agreement is being proposed is EMC is responsible for the payment of all costs, soft and hard consultants, and then the actual instruction and installation of all park equipment. It has a basketball court. It has a pickleball court, it has a playground, and it has benches that swing back and forth, and green spaces such as native plants. That's a, I have a picture. I, I don't know if that works over that controller picture, if that helps. Very good. Thanks, Ben. Okay. All right. Can, I think we I have a motion. Can I just say it's going to be such an improvement compared to what is there right now? Okay, after so spending a hole in the ground. <laughs> most of my career life at that corner. Uh, it's nice to see it be turned into something positive. Yep. Um, I'm not 100% familiar with Chapter 74. Like, can you give me just a brief overview of what that means to only be enforcing Chapter 74 that relates to parks? Thank you. That's a great question. It's still on, right? Good. All right. Chapter 74 has the, all the different rules. There's a lot in there. It's on our website. We also put the uh, rules of the park system on our website. That way anybody can see it very transparently. So, for example, you know, like, thou shall not run at a pool. All those fun rules. Uh, no glass containers in parks for safety. Uh, hours of operation are in there, too. So we're open from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. in parks. This is a neighborhood park. It has those same rules. It will close down at night at 10 p.m., like all other neighborhood parks. 
Uh, there's just a lot of those rules out there, I guess. If you had a specific question, I might be able to help you with that. Um, so I guess just my only question is that, like, you say police don't go to parks unless they are called on a complaint, but the private security would be able to patrol the park whenever and say, like, arrest somebody for having a plastic bottle or a, paper, a glass bottle, excuse me, or, like, what would their enforcement mechanism be? They can only educate. There's no real ticket writing ability with EMC when it comes to enforcement of the park rules. Their job is to report and help in the event that they're needed to help there, but then call the Des Moines Police Department for anything that would be more of a, a infraction of the rules that would result in some sort of ticket or beyond. That's what I was about to ask. Do we know if they're going to be armed? I don't know that question. That is a concern for me. I would want that answered before I would be comfortable voting yes on allowing private security in a public space. Yep. I also want to comment on the fact that, like, I appreciate that we're looking into getting more bathrooms, but having heard that we don't have anything in the budget for that, this would be a wonderful place to do that because we're, it's private money, um, and they could, you know, very easily put in a bathroom, um, and then we could maybe even lease for, like, another few hundred dollars or however much it would to make that up. I'm not sure how much it would be, but um, it seems like if we don't have the capacity to do that, this would be the place to do it. Especially to make it less, you know, I'm worried about private security, essentially um, harassing people who uh, live downtown, unhoused, unsheltered. Okay, Ben, thank you. We've got a motion. And I ask everybody to vote. Joe? Yes, Your Honor. Honor that six yes and one no. Motion carries. Item 45. It's on the request from the employer's mutual casualty company to amend the plan DSM, creating our tomorrow future land use designation of 701 Walnut Street from downtown mixed use to park open space and to rezone the property from DX1 downtown district to P2 public civic and institutional district to allow the development of a public recreation area use. A is the first consideration of the ordinance above, and B is the final consideration of the ordinance above. The waivers requested by Cindy McCauley, who is the Vice President of Administrative Services at EMC. This would require six votes. Um, we'll ask first uh, uh, parties in interest. That would be, in this case, uh, either EMC or property owners within 250 feet of the property to be rezoned. And we're going to give them up to five minutes uh, to speak. And second, we'll have uh, germane comments from the general public, one minute per person uh, to speak and seven minutes maximum. So let's ask, uh, are there any parties of interest here? Okay, good. We're good. We're good. Mayor County, members of the council, I'm Cindy McCauley, the Vice President of Administrative Services for EMC Insurance. And I just want to say that I hope you give consideration for rezoning of this, I'm sorry, rezoning of this vacant uh, parcel uh, for development of the park. The agreement that was just voted on is contingent upon the rezoning being successful. Otherwise, that agreement that was just voted on is, is null and void. Uh, it is necessary we cannot conduct our, or develop the park as is under the current zoning. I think um, this is a, a wonderful opportunity for a partnership between EMC and the city and to provide an amenity that currently is not um, anywhere in the downtown area. It's going to serve a lot of people, residents, workers, and visitors to the city of Des Moines and provide a lot of amenities. We're trying to do a lot in a little amount of space, and we're hoping to do as much as we can. So thank you. Yeah. No. Do I stay if I have mm -hmm. questions? Thank you, Cindy. Did you have answers to any of the questions that were asked previously? Yeah, I do. Uh, right. With regard to the guards being armed, they are not. Okay. Um, the idea with the additional security is actually supplemental to Des Moines. Our EMC campus is right across the street from the park, and the idea of us providing security is certainly just for the ability to notice things that are going on and to call the Des Moines police when necessary. 
It also allows us to go onto the site if there is a medical emergency to provide some assistance until the emergency uh, people can get there to do their job. Will your um, security team be trained in emergency medical services? They are. They are? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Um, so will there be interaction with anyone in the park beyond um, watching, calling the police, or coming down for a medical emergency? Only if necessary, and if that, that would be uh, if necessary to defuse a situation or if someone is in danger. Uh, there certainly could be that, that um, possibility. Um, do you have like specifications on the definition of necessary to diffuse a situation? I don't have any that I can share right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what is the possibility of putting a bathroom in this park? I think that because we did ask that question early on and we're told that the size of the park uh, does not require that it has restrooms like some of the other parks in Des Moines, so we did not program that in to the park. Would you be willing to add that? I will take that back. Uh, to the executives and to our design team for consideration. Okay. If um, the possibility is not made to put a bathroom in, would like this is within buildings, like it's near buildings, correct? It's with it's near like this, buildings. Sorry, this area is like surrounded by like EMC. Right, buildings we're right across the from. street. We're yeah. we're okay. south on the south side of Walnut Street. Okay, our campus. Would people mm -hmm. who are in the park be allowed to come in and use the bathroom in your building? We don't have public restrooms within don't our have campus. Public. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. There are some, depending on operating hours, that some neighboring uh, reach out across the street uh, at Kaleidoscope and then also at the partnership building, but it may be dependent on their operating hours. Okay, and that would probably not line up with the operating hours at the park. May or may not. I, I, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I can't no, I know. to their operating hours. That's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else Thank you. to speak? Yep. Any more parties in interest? All right. Anybody, general public? Come ahead. Taylor Weber, Ward 3. Uh, same thing. So we might as well keep talking on it, right? Uh, one thing that I find really interesting is now we're on rezoning. And uh, I think what we heard from EMC just now is that, like, this park is contingent on us rezoning this. And if you don't do it, you're not gonna have a park. And that's really cool, except now we're allowing corporations special access to say, uh, hey, I need things rezoned, scratch my back, you scratch yours. Uh, when council in the city has a consistent issue of helping other community resources get rezoned to make sure they don't experience the same issues as multi-million dollar corporations do. Uh, so things like community fridges, uh, urban farms, uh, houses people being in uh, city parks and, and that sort of stuff, those could all be so solved by addressing zoning concerns that we're doing here for EMC for a park. Great, I think parks are awesome, but we're still doing it for a corporation that's saying, unless you do this, we're not gonna do this other thing for you. So I really think that if you, you need to take this energy and keep it going for the Hello, Denver, Ward 3. So they say that there's places around, you know, to use the bathroom. Is that businesses? Because I literally just went on my phone and Googled public restrooms and it shows none downtown. The nearest one is Gray's Lake. Um, and so are you saying that if I have to go to the bathroom at this new park, I have to go all the way to Gray's Lake? Because some places, especially if I look disheveled, if I am houseless, they will not let me into their business. So true. Uh, Peyton Shoemaker, Ward 1. Um, I would just like to say, uh, I want to point out that um, what the representative from EMC just said is that when they were drafting the plans for the park, they were told that they didn't need to have a bathroom. And now you guys are saying, like, we would have put a bathroom in if we could have, but clearly there was an opportunity to talk about it before, and you guys just didn't. So I would like to point that out. I also think it's concerning that um, we still don't really have a distinct definition on what the necessary need to call the police is in this park with uh, their security force. Um, I mean, it's great if you just have someone always watching over the park, you know, to help people if there's a medical emergency. 
but I don't think it's as great of a thing to just always have someone watching the park and that person be the judgment of if it's necessary to call the police when we don't know what biases that person has or anything like that. So I think it's really concerning and I just wanted to bring that to your attention also. True. Hello. Jalen, um, Ward 3, just want to uplift again the comments that have been made previously, uh, especially what Peyton was just saying, because, you know, I was thinking about these security guards and in my head I'm like, okay, they're just going to sit out and watch the park all day and decide who to call the cops on and who not to call the cops on. Sounds like, you know, professional racial profilers. Um, <laughs> So yeah, that's, I, I think it's a problem and I think it's concerning. Um, and also again, wanna just uplift the need for a restroom. I think that it is necessary just because maybe city code says like a park that's this small doesn't need to have a public restroom. I don't think that that means that there's not a need for the public restroom. I think that there are tons of people who live downtown, um, especially on house folks who do need a public restroom and we know that there are none downtown. So if we're gonna be putting money in to make this park, make a space for everyone, a space for the community, we should be sure that there's resources there for the community like a public restroom. I think that that's something that um, should be non-negotiable when we're talking about rezoning this and we're talking about building this park. Thanks. Bridget Peterson, Ward 2, she, hers. Um, everything everyone said uh, so far, uh, I would like to uplift. Um, I know we've been talking a lot about um, houseless folks, but um, I keep thinking about how I used to teach preschool down at the Science Center, and we would frequently walk to um, the... Uh, the place where the fountain is over by the Civic Center. We would walk to various spots downtown. And I'm imagining none of you uh, have ever had to deal with 24 year olds at once, but they all go to the bathroom pretty frequently. <laughs> so um, aside from like adults who might use the park, you know, kids got to go to the bathroom like once every two hours. So that's, you know, something you might have glossed over. Uh, Abby Banks, she, her, Ward 3, uh, reiterating what everyone else has said, I think it's great that we're having more green space, having more park space for our community, and I think it's great that a uh, big corporation wants to provide that help, um, but I think in order to not just be accepting crumbs from these corporations, we need to make sure these parks actually serve the purpose of the D people of Des Moines and then need, meet the needs of the people of Des Moines and not serve as like a self-satisfying pat on the back for EMC. So that's just my thoughts. Hi, John Noble, Ward 1. Um, I really want us to think about the definition of public here, because we've talked about this as a, as a public space. Um, but to the, to the points that were made about racial profiling, um, if you're a, a black person in this park, is this a public space for you if you have the fear of being racially profiled uh, by someone on this private security team or by DMT, DMPD? Um, if you're a houseless person for the same reason or for similar reasons, is this a public space for you? Is this a safe space for you? Um, if you need to use the restroom, is this a, a public space for you? Um, I, run down, I run in downtown sometimes. If I'm running by this park, is this a public space for me where I could stop on my run and hang out if I need to use the restroom? Um, uh, to go back to the point that uh, Councilmember Shoemaker made about anti-homeless architecture, if that's something that's going to be in this park, is that a public space? So if we're going to like folks have said, let private corporations do this. We need to, you need to be willing as the government of this city to, to flex your power a little bit and make this a truly public space, or you need to be investing in public spaces yourself. Jolene Prescott, um, Ward 2. So I am a person that needs a place to sit. You know, I can only stand for so long. So, if we have a homeless person laying on the bench, what do I, no, what do I do? What do I do? But it, that our parks are not a homeless shelter. They are a place for people to use. Well, what I mean We're is- We're gonna ask I you not to, to disrupt sit. the speaker at the microphone. We've been I need, respectful I need, to you. I need a, hey, stop. I'm being interrupted. I think some people need to go out the door. Okay, we're gonna ask everybody, please 
you were, everyone's been respectful to you while you were speaking. Be respectful to this individual as well. So I need a place to sit and I have a homeless person taking up a whole bench. But I, but I have disabilities that I need to sit. What do I do? That's why they have that kind of thing going on. Okay, that's why we need those. Those little ridges in there. Because I want a place to sit. You know, go ahead and laugh. When you're my age and have trouble with your knees, you'll feel differently. I the home, yeah, but they're taking up the bench. They're laying down. I don't mind. It. I'd like to offer a compromise to this argument that's happening in the audience. There can be single seats and double seats. And yeah, but what I'm saying is that the benches are not a place well, they don't have a house. Okay. That's all right. We have a. We've done our seven minutes. Let's move. Let this be the last speaker. There you go. All right. I don't really know what to say to the previous speaker other than if you don't want people to talk to you, maybe don't look at them and direct your comments to them. That was pretty weird to react badly to people you're talking to reacting to what you're saying. That's how conversations work. We're going to ask um, you to talk and about now I'm being for the record. But the points that I have are that um, we're rezoning. It's kind of weird because we're putting a public zone, but it is a private spot that we're renting. I think that's weird. Maybe that is how the city code works. But it is weird because we're zoning it as public when it is private. Um, it's also alarming to me that EMC is going above and beyond to say, hey, we know how much security you're providing. We want to provide more. Why don't they have the same attitude for bathrooms and other resources? Um, if they're willing to do things that they aren't required to do, why is it policing but not bathrooms? Um, that's all. Thank you. All right. I would like to move to consider A but not B on 45. We already um, have a motion. I didn't think we had a motion. Does my motion that I said not count? He, were, he asked for before you interrupted to, to speak. Sorry, his microphone speak. wasn't on, so I couldn't hear him. I'm just asking okay. if my motion is still on the table since I did say it. I think you have to be recognized as a speaker. Okay. Thank you. I am happy to have consideration of 45A. And then I'll move 45B separately. Uh, I'm happy to move 45A. I appreciate, like I said before, the work that EMC, EMC has done uh, in coming to the table and being a partner. Uh, I certainly think we can continue to have conversation about the restrooms. Uh, at the other facilities that we have added them, they are a very expensive item in the restrooms, which is why we do not have them at more parks. We're working through that. Um, it can be, I think, <coughs> three, four hundred thousand, half a million dollars for restroom facilities. Uh, and then there is limited space in this particular facility. I'm committed to working on that issue more broadly in the downtown, but uh, appreciate the comments and I'm happy to move item 45 and 45A. And then after that we can have, I will plan on moving 45B as well. All right, Indira. Thank you. Um, I want to clarify that I am very supportive of this project. I want to see it succeed. Um, I would be happy to have more conversations about the security issue and about the bathroom issue, and it seems like EMC is open to having those conversations. Um, so I would request that we do pass 45A, but that we consider not passing 45B so that we do have the opportunity to have those further conversations. That's all. All right. 45 and 45A have been moved. Ask everyone to vote. Joe? Your Honor, I'll vote yes, and just uh, like to thank EMC for their commitment and and their investment in in this park for all for everyone to be able to use downtown. I, I think it's going to be a great asset. We've talked about bathrooms for years, and as Josh pointed out, very very expensive. 
uh, to put bathrooms, and that's why we're going to continue to work through, I believe, the list that we already have of, of bathrooms and trying to get them in. I think we can only do one or two, possibly a year, in the parks, if even that many. Okay. Your Honor, that was seven yes. The motion carried. All right. Now, I believe we have a motion for 45B. I, I will be happy to move 45B. And All right. 45B has been moved. Joe? I'll vote yes, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Your Honor, that's six yes, one no. Motion carries. Item 46, it's on a request from Mid-Eastern Council on Chemical Abuse to amend Plan DSM, creating our Tomorrow Future Land Use designation for property located at 3451 Easton Boulevard from low-density residential to neighborhood mixed use to allow the rezoning and group living use of the property for expansion of an existing outpatient rehabilitation facility and provision of an overnight stay accommodation for the patients. A is the first consideration of the ordinance above, and B is the final consideration of the ordinance above. The waiver is requested by Michelle De La, Ria, De, De La Riva, I'm sorry, Executive Director, uh, and this requires six votes. Again, this is a rezoning item. And uh, we will ask if there's any parties in interest uh, in the audience. First of all, the uh, individual representing Mid-Eastern Council. Good evening. It's on? It sounds like it. Good. Um, I'm Michelle Della Riva. And I'm the executive director at Prelude Behavioral Services. And I do want to thank you um, for considering our rezoning this evening. Uh, I did want to start just by providing a little bit of information about who we are. So Prelude Behavioral Services is a not-for-profit, CARF-accredited organization providing comprehensive substance use, problem gambling, and mental health services. We have been providing services for the past 50 years. We're licensed with the Iowa Department of Public Health and accredited with the Department of Human Services. Prelude was founded in 1969 in Iowa City as the Johnson County Citizen Committee on Alcoholism. The name of the agency was changed to the Mid-Eastern Council on Chemical Abuse in 1978 and then to Mecca in 2011. So that might be how you guys know us. Uh, a regional facility was opened in Des Moines in the year 2000 and then satellite locations were added to provide access to services throughout Central and Eastern Iowa. The Bernie Lorenz Recovery House, was, which is located at 4014 Kingman Boulevard, or Kingman Avenue, um, became a program of Mecca in 2007. Uh, the program provides services specifically for women um, that are suffering from substance use disorders. On February 1st um, in 2015, Mecca officially changed its name to Prelude Behavioral Services, and the name Prelude was chosen because it means um, it reflects our mission of opening doors to new beginnings. COVID um, provides a full continuum of substance use services to Iowans, including prevention and early intervention, evaluations, detoxification, outpatient and residential treatment programs, halfway house and transitional housing, and case management. Uh, since 1984, we have offered mental health services and administered an employee assistance program out of our Iowa City locations. Uh, we also started providing problem gambling services, education, and treatment in 2007. So today, Prelude provides services to more than 5,000 Iowans each year, and they come from a diverse background. We are committed to re we are committed to serving hard to reach and disenfranchised populations and to breaking down barriers to hinder, that hinder access to behavioral health services. So the first step in our project is really focused on expanding our outpatient services program at 3451 Easton Boulevard. The expansion, expansion is really in response to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. What we have found over the last 18 months that our Iowans are more involved with drinking and substance use than ever before. Being isolated from friends, 
family and coworkers during this time has been had a negative impact on many Iowans that has led to them to feel the burden of social isolation, which can lead to depression, anxiety, and potential substance use. So our focus right now is to expand our outpatient clinic. Um, the expansion really would be looking at uh, adding additional group rooms as well as individual offices for additional staff members. The second step in our expansion, which is a little further out, would be to move our adult residential program to the central campus. Our adult residential program currently is at 3806 Easton Boulevard. That program has an adult program for men as well as women. Um, the point of moving them to a central campus is to really provide the opportunity to increase security, safety, and accessibility of the programs by adding new safety and accessibility features as well as having all of our staff all in one location. Um, additionally, we'll be doing a feasibility study to look at adding detox services here in Des Moines, as well as potential adolescent residential programming and um, a sobering center. So that is something that we certainly want to look at to see if that's something that the city would be um, benefiting from. So. We certainly do hope that you consider our rezoning as we start to look to expand services in order to be able to treat more individuals here in Des Moines. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. Your, Your Honor, can I can I ask a question to, for Michelle? Yes. Uh, Michelle, thank you so much, and and I appreciate uh, the effort that you're putting towards. I, I'm, I'm definitely in favor of this. I did have one question and one request that I had passed on to uh, Councilmember Westergaard. And I'm not sure if it ever got taken care of. You have two schools very close proximity to where you're putting this at. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've requested just to have a sit down so you can explain to them what, you know, what this is going to be, how it's going to have, if any, impact on them. Um, and I, I just wondered, did you have an opportunity to do that yet? I did not receive any requests from any area schools. Um, what I can tell um, this council is um, that our residential program, which I think sometimes that's what schools are most interested in, is two blocks away from the campus currently. So we don't expect that there would be more traffic. We don't expect to have more residential programs um, other than the addition of detox. So currently our residential program has 28 beds for men and 16 beds for women. Those would be the same number of beds that we would have if we are able to expand that residential clinic. Um, in addition, um, we would add two gender neutral spaces because what we do find is that there are times when people may come in that don't feel comfortable on a residential unit that's specific for men or women and would rather have that space where they can just feel really welcome and, and be able to choose which programming that they participate in. Um, so. I'm happy to sit down with any area schools that would have questions about what our program does or what our yeah, I think you have like. Yeah, you have two schools, and, and I don't believe there's any objections to what you're doing. As a matter of fact, I think they would be encouraged by some of the things you're doing. Yeah. But, they, they, you know, when they got a card in the mail, they were concerned because they just didn't know anything about it. And so... I thought there was some type of meeting that was going to be set up before you were before you came in, in front of us, and I, I, I'd like for you to do that maybe before we vote on the final consideration because I think, you know, having two elementary, high school uh, schools that are very close proximity, I, I think they just want to hear what you're going to do, and you know, I don't see any perceived problems. I, I think they would be very supportive and, and possibly be able to partner with you, but they should have an opportunity to at least hear from you, and, and I was hoping that would get done before you came in front of us. We did have our neighborhood meeting. Yeah, we ha there was a neighborhood meeting, Joe. So they were invited to that meeting. Yeah, I, I, I think, Linda, I gave you two, two names of the principals, and uh, it's, it's unfortunate that they weren't contacted uh, before, before tonight. But, well, that's um, yeah, that might have happened. You might have sent that to me after our neighborhood meeting. Yeah, I don't think they were contacted about any neighborhood meeting. Okay. Well, I can I can contact them and meet with Michelle, but sure. there was a neighborhood meeting and it was everybody was supportive. 
they're really not doing anything different than what they've been doing. Um, yeah, no, I understand. And I'm not saying they're not supportive. It's just it's something changed. And, and I think that, you know, they're responsible for young children and they just like to know what, you know, what, what's changing and what, what's happening. And, and that's all. That's all that they that that's all they requested to do, and it's unfortunate that no one has reached out to them yet. So I would be supportive of A, but I won't be supportive of B uh, at this time. Uh, even though I think this is a great project, and and I want to see it to move forward, uh, I think it's important that we have these uh, throughout the city. But they they have a right to to sit down with you and have a discussion with you. And are you talking about the the Grand View? Grandview. So I'm talking about both schools. There's St. Joseph's School. The principal had had reached out, and uh, yes, Grandview Christian. Yeah, there's two there's two schools there, Linda. Okay. Both that I contacted you about earlier. Are there any other questions for me? I have maybe an unimportant question. Okay. You said you changed your name to Prelude, but it's listed as Mecca still. I was just curious why. I think that um, I do not have the I don't have the answer for right. you. I apologize for that. It's okay. <laughs> I think the property is still owned under Mecca's name. I don't think we've updated the ownership. Would be my guess. I've been the director for nine months, so um, I'll write that down. though. No, I'm, I was just curious. Um, <laughs> But uh, another point of clarification, you, I, is this that you're expanding the central campus that you were referring to? And then there is another campus that would be relocated here eventually? Correct. So okay. our step one, right now we have an outpatient clinic at 3451. We really want to expand our outpatient clinic. What we have found is there's just, there are people that are drinking and using that never have drank or used before. Mm -hmm. um, the pandemic really, if you look at liquor sales, things like that, people are drinking, just anxiety and social isolation is making that just astronomical. Yeah. Um, our second phase, which may be quite a bit down the road, is really to move our current residential program to this campus. I see. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have the plans, if you guys were able to see that. Um, but this particular campus, um, we own nearly eight acres. So it really will be a beautiful area for folks coming in for substance use, mental health and gambling treatment. You know, I, I feel that people with chronic conditions such as substance use, mental illness, diabetes, heart disease, deserve to come into a program that is welcoming and, and, and inviting. And that's what we're looking for. All right, thank you. Are there any other speakers who would like to um, speak that are parties in interest first? Party in interest? All right, now let's, uh, general public, come ahead. I don't know how to use this, I'm sorry. Push it off. You can have it off. You hear me? Yes. Okay, Natalie Harwood, Ward 1. I want to express support for the Prelude Plan. Um, this is really close to my heart and has impacted my life a lot over the last year and the life of my family. And we don't have nearly enough services and especially enough beds in the area. So I think that this is a really good idea. Uh, hey, my name is Luke Bascom, Ward 1. Um, yeah, I think this is a great project, it sounds like. Um, this could really serve our community. I want to quickly respond just to Joe Gatto's point. Um, we don't need to be, I think kind of what he's getting at is that having more people that have addiction issues is making our community less safe, which is just not accurate. Um, we shouldn't be thinking about folks who have addiction issues um, as people that potentially we need to criminalize or that aren't safe to be around children. Um, and so I think that shouldn't be something that holds you all back from uh, voting yes to pass this. Also, if the schools are within the community, it seems like they um, you know, should be able to reach out on their own and that's not really for Joe Gatto to slow down this process for them. Um, and then I just was uh, curious for Michelle whether 
you have like specific rules for who gets access to your services. Michelle, could you answer that to him separately? Yeah. Just give him an answer. Any, um, any other speakers, please? I'm curious of the answer as well. Come ahead. Well, it, if you should have asked it uh, before, go ahead. I'll just be really quick. So, um, as a not for profit agency, we accept um, referrals from everyone. So, we have a sliding fee scale for anyone who may not have health care insurance, and then we have um, in contracts with many insurance companies. So, it really is open to anyone uh, and I, who lives in Iowa. And residency for our um, sliding fee scale means that you've slept somewhere for overnight here. So, like day? yep, okay. yep. All as right. long as you can give, they can provide an address. All right. So, next speaker. Yeah, that's always going to work. Taylor Weber, uh, Ward Three. Yeah, I, I appreciate Luke's comments. I completely echo those. I think that letting that go unchecked as a connotation on the community is really dangerous. Uh, the other thing I would push back on as well, Joe, I, I don't think the same concerns existed at the last meeting and the meeting before when Menards and other large corporations were asking for zoning extensions to, uh, to not put up trees in their parking lot. And so going at and allowing that to continue and, and hand wringing about uh, letting and making the zoning code easier. But then when it comes to real community services that are being provided here, we're slow rolling. Uh, I would also point out if we're not happy who was contacted on the project, I believe that's also in the city code that whoever's within 250 feet, if I'm not uh, mistaken, and if the school isn't within it, what uh, I've heard from the council in the past is they need to show up at these types of instances and allow their public comments to be heard. So I don't think we can have it both ways, uh, especially when it's a service that's direly lacking in the city. Um, my name is Alejandro Ortiz, Ward 1. Um, I've been working with uh, immigrant communities for over a year at this point, and unfortunately, when uh, an individual is criminalized, especially for uh, substance use and such, they have. Uh, requirements that they have to meet in order to um, you know not go to jail not go to prison and there are not a lot of resources that are even willing to work with me if someone doesn't say have a social security number if they don't have certain forms of identification and um, uh, prelude has been one of the only ones that i haven't had any luck with so um, i would just like to say that we should be uh, i mean addressing those concerns for one but also uh, Prelude has uh, at least uh, shown to me that they, they are actually an inclusive um, organization that, that should be uh, expanding so that we can continue to do that for even more of the folks that we're criminalizing. Okay. Hey, this is Jalen. Um, just want to uplift the comments that have been made previously before me. I agree with all of them. I think that this sounds like a good project. I am supportive of the rezoning. I think that all of the services that are being offered here in this project are necessary and they need to be expanded. I think we need to be putting more public money into these type of services, especially when we're talking about mental health services. We know that the city right now does not put money into mental health services. I think that's an issue. We need to be sure we're addressing those. Um, and if we really care about substance abuse issues in our community and making sure that folks are really getting the help that they need. I I think the city should prioritize decriminalizing substance use, um, especially cannabis and other, uh, you know, all substance use. We need to really prioritize decriminalizing so that people can actually get the help that they need. And we're treating this like the health problem that it is instead of a criminal problem. Thanks. All right. Do we um, have a motion? With, with that, I'll make a motion to move 46 and 46A. And then if we could come back and vote on 47B, 46. but 46B, I'm sorry, but I will make the commitment that uh, I will get in touch with the schools that Joe mentioned, and I will connect them with, with, with Prelude, 
and they can discuss. But there was a public meeting. I, you know, I, I have no idea why they didn't reach, just reach out to Prelude. You're, you're right there. But I can tell everybody that this property where they're going to expand is, is you can't even see it. I mean, it's been there for years and years and years, and people drive by and you have no idea it's even there because it's in a very uh, well-protected area. It's surrounded by trees. I would bet 90% of the people don't even know that it's there. Uh, right now, there are other property that they're uh, wanting to eventually move is right on the corner of East 38th and uh, from East 38th and uh, uh, Easton. And it's wide out in the open. There's certainly... Um, <laughs> It, it's right there, and it's near schools, so it's it's not really like we're changing anything. So I'm a little surprised, but I'm still very happy to reach out. I will connect with Michelle. I will connect with the schools, and we can do a Zoom call or something to talk. But the information is there. If they go on to the you know plan and zoning meetings, everything was outlined right there. But we'll still do that. But my motion is to, is to approve item 46 and 46A. And to bring it back at the next meeting? Uh, no, then we'll do 46B okay. tonight okay. as okay, a separate vote. Okay. I need six votes. Okay, got it. Okay, thanks. All right, voting's in process. Joe? Yes, Your Honor, for A. Your Honor, that's seven, yes. Motion carries. All right, now I think I heard a separate motion for 46B. Yes, sir, 46B. Voting's in progress. Joe? Your Honor, uh, I will uh, vote no for this, just specifically because the ward council member was asked over a month ago to set up a meeting between Mecca and, and the schools, and it hasn't been done yet. It's not that any of the schools or myself or against this project, we just gave them a commitment that that's what we would do. And I, I think, I, I'm not sure why we have to expedite it within two weeks and not do what we say we were going to do, but that's fine. Uh, I will just vote no for this and move on. Joe, I wish you would have reminded me of it. All right. I'm sorry. Before we move on from this item, I would just like to say thank you sincerely for the work that you do in the community. Um, I think that getting the support of some of the people in this crowd is a huge, it, it means a lot. <laughs> so thank you. All right, the, the vote on 46B was 6-1. Item moves forward. Item 47 is on the 2022 PCC Pavement Patching Program, a resolution approving the plan, specifications, form of contract documents, engineers estimate and receive and file bids and designating the lowest responsible bidder as TK Concrete Inc. Tony J. Vermeer is the president, $924,675. Council communication number 22-007. A is approval of the contract and the bond and permission to sublet. Um, Mayor County, I'd be happy to move 47 and 47A. All right. 47, 47A have been moved. I will ask if there's any public uh, comment. Seeing none, voting's in progress. Joe? Yes. Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. All right. That completes our hearings. It's 6.07, and uh, we're going to move back to, I believe, uh, in your item 26. This is a communication from Planning and Zoning. 26 is regarding a city-initiated request for the vacation of a remaining east-to-west alley segment to the west of 6th Avenue in the block between Walnut Street and Mulberry Street. Indira. Okay, um, on item 26, I have a big issue with the intention for this space moving forward. 
The intention is to put up a fence to block off this alleyway, um, but I will bring to the council's attention that this is an alleyway that is directly near the downtown pantry and is uh, right on a bus stop and is a place where people who are unsheltered, who um, live downtown, who are about downtown, um, or who need to use the pantry um, have been spending time. And I think if you look at the, um, at the item on uh, the agenda, if you look at all of the details, you can see in the picture um, of the area that is specifying the um, dimensions of the fence, there are, I can see four people in that picture when it was taken. This is a space that is utilized by the community and my concern is that our intention um, for requesting this vacation, for allowing potentially a lease or, or, or whatever agreement we come to, um, to have this fence put up is essentially anti-homeless architecture. Um, it's violent to our houseless community. It creates less spaces for um, people to exist downtown. Um, it is just continuing our trend of trying to push people out instead of addressing the needs. Um, if this were a project that were to say, vacate the alleyway to allow for seating to be put in or something like that, that would be a completely different issue. Um, however, putting up a fence is something that I cannot get on board with. So as this is um, a receive and file from planning and zoning sort of situation, I would move to receive and file, but then to strike the last bit of that motion um, that says refer to the engineering department real estate division. I would not like this to continue uh, through the city. So my motion is to receive and file and not take any action after that. Uh, I'll ask our uh, acting uh, manager here, Matt, um, could you give us kind of an update regarding the recommendation for planning zoning, why it was uh, came from them and what the intention is here? Sure, thank you, Mayor. And and I will, I will also defer to some other council members who've been active on this project for the past year. Um, the, um, this is at a request from multiple members of the public, uh, neighbors in the area and hotel guests and businesses in the area. Um, the, the location and uh, around the alley, um, since the Surety Hotel opened up, um, we've received complaints, numerous complaints of uh, public intoxication, intimidation, fights um, uh, coming from hotel guests and a lot of similar requests and noise requests coming from residents of the Fleming Building which is the building to the north on the north side of the alley. So um, in response to that, we were approached by the owners of the two buildings and the operators of the two buildings um, for the safety of their guests and their residents um, to make some design modifications to try to prohibit this activity and to encourage the feeling of safety in the area. Um, so the, um, the council's action is, um, is related to the vacation of the alley. The owners working together have worked with a fence company um, and uh, have a, a, a designed a, a plan where they could still have access for fire egress out of that uh, out of that vacated space and uh, as you as you can see in the picture uh, uh, access for the dumpster area uh, that serves the back of those buildings. Um, so this would ultimately be paid for and installed by the by the two private developers uh, who own the buildings and uh, the real estate department would arrange for the uh, proper easements to take place. Okay, can I request that the picture be brought up on the screen that I'm referring to, of the picture of the alleyway? A little bit lower. One more, or two more pages. Mm -hmm. Three more. One more. Mm -hmm. There it is, thank you very much. Okay, um, I do understand that generally the ward council member moves, but because I pulled this item to speak on it, it my, my purpose was to move it without furthering any action. But, it, and that, that's fine. I, I'm not going to support this particular motion. That's fine. I understand, uh, I understand the concerns that you're raising, and that's a constant challenge with, with what is going on from a homeless perspective and houseless residents downtown. This is a solution that uh, the neighboring properties have worked collaboratively to come up with. The alternative 
uh, and what this will defer, or one of the things that this will defer, uh, is continued enforcement, uh, because there are a large number of police calls, uh, and uh, I believe a significant number of arrests, although folks are not held long, it's it's a minor charge, but it it is, I think, a less desirable approach in this particular area. So I'm, I know it does not solve the solution, and and I I know that this is a broader issue that we still have to tackle. Uh, but I will support the property owners moving forward and trying to resolve this particular uh, this particular item. So I encourage my other colleagues to vote no, and then I will plan on moving this item so that we can move forward uh, based on the work that has I'm been not done my motion. previously. So I would like to address just a couple of the statements that were made. Um, one of the statements that was made is that we are working with property owners, that was brought up by property owners. Um, and part of the system, um, and I brought this up with city staff earlier, Part of the system that we use for this is to um, notify the surrounding areas um, and we notified the neighborhood association. There was no notification of any of the people who actually use this alleyway. There was no notification for anybody who potentially sleeps in this alleyway, for anybody who sits there to eat their lunch in this alleyway. So that systemically does not give us any feedback from the actual people who use this alleyway. It only gives us feedback from property owners and that is extremely concerning to me. Um, also, to say this isn't a solution, but we want to this and that and the other thing, we're just saying we're going to ignore the problem and we're going to displace people. That's what we're actually doing. And so my concern is like a solution could be obviously a larger solution of housing people, of you know like improving people's material conditions, but a more immediate solution would be not to send police officers in, but to send mediators, violence de-escalators, like to start anything like that in this area because we cannot just say that somebody's input is more important than the others, especially when we haven't even heard one of those, those pieces of input. Um, so I will not be withdrawing my motion. My motion stands. I do not accept this project. Can I just bring up too, this was not just property owners. These are the people that are living in those apartments that have been harassed and challenged by the people that are in the alley. And according to the homeless shelter, many of these people are not homeless. They don't show up they don't show up uh, when people the in between people they are people that are residents probably of the city but i'm just saying this was not about property owners this is about what we found from the citizens who gave us the input which led to discussing that with the property owners and again we have not heard any input from the other side of this we're just picking a winner in this situation instead of bringing like any kind of like and bringing people together, figuring out a solution. We're just saying that we heard from you, and so we've decided that your issue is what we're going to deal with, and we're going to displace people okay. from where they eat to do that. They're not being displaced. We have a motion on the item, table, so. and uh, let's go ahead and vote. Sorry, I had the. Yeah. Mayor, is there more than just one picture? I what, had mine did, went. Did Council Member Shoemaker put, on, put a couple pictures up. I only got to see one. Mine. Can I, can I clear mine? I didn't, I hit pass or something. We need to clear. Sorry, mine. Joe, just for clarification, there was um, an overhead view of a map. Um, there were two overhead views of maps. One was. Okay. Yeah, that's it. All right. Well, I, I'm familiar with the area. I just thought there was more pictures. And so we're, what is the motion? Because I'm thoroughly confused at this point. I apologize. Motion is to receive and file and not take any more action after that point. Okay. And there's going to be, a, if it doesn't pass, a an alternate uh, to move forward. Yeah, I'll vote no for the motion. Your Honor, that's six no, one yes. All right. I carry. Uh, Josh, I think you had an alternate motion to move forward. The item. item 26 uh, as as it's on the agenda okay Josh you're just moving the planning and zoning commission uh, what they gave us correct yep. correct okay thank you I vote yes you 
Your Honor, that's six yes, one no. Motion carries. Okay. Uh, moving to item 34, which is approving a second renewal agreement to license agreement with the Islamic Center of Des Moines for the use of a portion of Glendale Cemetery to bury deceased members of the Islamic faith. Council communication number 22-002. Indira. Um, and I just had a clarifying question on this, and I apologize for not being able to get in touch with uh, Ben Page earlier, but my clarifying question was just, this is a um, essentially like, yeah, a lease agreement for a certain number of spaces, and I just didn't know, I know there's other religious groups that also have this lease agreement. I just didn't know if it's essentially more expensive to bury your deceased um, if you are burying your deceased through the Islamic Center um, than it is for other people because of that $5,000 um, lease agreement. Does that make sense as a question? Because there's like, yeah. there's, I didn't know if it was an additional charge that other people don't pay, essentially. All right, well, if Ben's here, we'll ask him to step in and, and handle that, but it probably in the future we ought to ask him that. No, I know, I didn't, I didn't have time to do That's that. That's right, okay. We can move on to a different one and then come back to this if we're waiting for him to show up as well. That's fine. All me. right. Maybe just to clarify it, you're you're in support of it. Oh, here he is. Sorry. <laughs> Mayor County, members of Des Moines City Council, Ben Page, Parks and Recreation Director. I think I'm gonna repeat your question to make sure I got it right. Does the five thousand dollars cost more for a typical Muslim burial service in our cemetery system? Is that correct? Is it essentially more expensive to be Muslim and die than it is to not? Because there's that extra five thousand dollars. Uh I'll give you the answer that I have is that, that it's a license agreement that gives exclusive use to that group because they have a different process. Mm -hmm. And so we actually look at what we could normally make in that section. We call them a section like a block in the neighborhood. If you go through Glendale, you see different blocks outlined by roads. So they have different processes they use that require us to have capture less revenue. That's part of it. And they get exclusive use of that so no other groups can be buried in that section. That's what the $5,000 fee covers. I don't know if my question was answered. Um, uh, there are like other groups, other religious groups may pay a, a fee to have a similar situation. But in general, if you are not part of one of those religious groups and you are buried at Glendale Cemetery, you essentially don't have whatever portion of that fee, so it's less expensive. It could be less expensive if they chose to be buried and turned in a different section of Glendale Cemetery. Okay. Yep. Um, I don't want to disrupt this agreement in any way, um, but that is a little bit concerning and I might want more conversation about that at some point. Anytime. Okay, thank you. Motion to approve. Your Honor, I'll move item 34. Yep, uh, and you did, and uh, are you a yay? Yes. Your Honor, seven yes, motion carries. Thank you, Duke. Item 38 is a, uh, hang on one second. Again, this is uh, approving uh, purchase of a remote operated explosive ordinance robot system for use by the statewide certified explosive ordinance detection EOD teams from Safeware Inc. with the 2021 Homeland Security Explosive Ordinance Device Grant. Council communication number 22-004, Indira. Okay, so this is an issue that um, has been coming up on council journals for a couple years because we've been um, repurchasing uh, or replacing these remote operated explosive ordinance robot systems um, for the seven statewide bomb squad teams for the last few years. This would be the last of the seven that needed to be replaced. Um, and I spoke about this last year um, when it was on the council agenda. Uh, I do not approve of us spending this money on, um, for the police, first of all. Um, but I also think that the uh, standards to which we are trying to achieve um, are much higher than the need that exists in Des Moines. And I will not sit here and pretend that there is not a need to be able to defuse a bomb in Des Moines. I think we all know that we've had a lot of bomb threats this month and specifically this week. Um, 
And I think that is extremely serious and we need to take that extremely seriously, but we also know that we have um, these extremely expensive bomb squads that we fund, and I understand that it is an agreement through um, the federal government and the state that we fund all of the statewide bomb squads, but that, that hasn't prevented um, white supremacist bomb threats, that hasn't prevented attacks on our democracy potentially. Um, and I think that if anybody were to look into, as I did last year, um, what the requirements are to remain a type one um, bomb squad in Iowa or in the country, um, and the type of robots that we're buying, we would see that this is actually a very dangerous thing to be doing. Um, there are situations across the country where police officers have used robots that are like specifically this brand. I think that the model that we're replacing um, was like the first robot that ever killed someone. Um, we know that a bomb squad in California like blew up an entire city block um, last year. Generally, I think that it is important that we have a way to defuse um, threats. I do not think that that should be through the police department or through any law enforcement agency. I think that that needs to be a specialized team um, that has more accountability um, for the public. And I don't think that we anywhere near meet the need that a type one bomb squad um, requires. And so I will not, I, I don't want to approve 38 or 39, but we can All right, uh, talk I'll about that the, um, uh, Sitting um, replacement uh, <laughs> the, substitute the, manager. The new manager. Uh, to uh, give us <laughs> some new clarification new here. Yeah, uh, I think uh, Council Member Schumacher uh, summarized that. Schumacher, but, sorry. Schumacher, sorry. That's sorry. okay. <laughs> Councilmember Shoemaker uh, summarized that uh, relationship between uh, us and the other state ju statewide jurisdictions very well um, regarding the purchase for item number 38, and you're going to speak on 39. Specifically um, on 38, the system being purchased will is is that pass through uh, that that device will be going to the Quad Cities, and not not at, not in the city of Des Moines, and the uh, purchase being done on 39. Um, that device, those devices will be in the Quad Cities and the State of Iowa Fire Marshal. So these are not actually going to be um, utilized by the City of Des Moines. Or our Police Department. Or our Police Department and simply our, our, our role is the administrator on, on passing through the, the, the federal requirements and federal funds. So then I'll make a further statement. I would not like to administrate these things to happen anywhere in the state. I, I'll move item 38 for approval. <laughs> Your Honor, I'll vote yes. Did I miss anything for 39 that I need to mention? Your Honor, that's six yes, one no. Motion carries. Indira, item 39, purchase of two uh, recognized portable digital imaging systems for a statewide explosive ordnance detection EOD teams with Scanna MSC Inc with 2021 Homeland Security Explosive Ordinance Grant, Council Communication Number 22-005, Indira. Restate my previous thoughts. Okie doke, do we have a motion? I'll move item 39. Your Honor, I'll move item 39. Somebody will. <laughs> yeah. I'll vote yes. <laughs> Your Honor, that's six yes. One no. Motion carries. Okay. Uh, we're moving on to ordinances. Final consideration 43, amending section 2 1176 and 2 1177 relating to the creation, composition, appointment, and powers and duties of the Youth Advisory Board. Indira. Um, first, a clarifying question since this is a third consideration. You are allowed to, like, amend things in between considerations and not have to start over, right? Like you can, like if you pass an ordinance on the first consideration, but then you change something for the second consideration, you don't have to start over at first consideration. So on third consideration, we could change something and then we wouldn't have to start over. If it's not a substantive change. If it's a substantive change, you have to start over. Okay, so you'll tell me if it's substantive. Um, <laughs> the only thing, I think this is a great program. Um, I like all the amendments that were made. I would just want to, um, on, 
Section 2-1177, powers and duties, um, either like a sub point to uh, section five or potentially an additional point. I'm not really sure how that would go about. Um, it says advise and make recommendations to city council and city departments. I would just want an accountability piece from the city um, as like a response essentially to say we received this recommendation, here's what we did about it, um, and have that be sent back to the council, or here's what we didn't do about it and here's why. Sure. That's cool? Yeah. All right, then I would like to move with that amendment. Sure. The, the, the issue will be we'll have to draft up what that language <laughs> might be. So unless you have specific language yeah, no, I don't. So the, would it be continued to the next one with an amendment? That would be our advice. And okay. I, I can work with you to draft the language that you're talking about. Are there any that. questions from council about what I'm talking about? Mr. Attorney, do you understand the change uh, that she's making? It sounds like at least it's not substantive. It, yeah, it's a, but, it sounds like it's just a, an actual communication of the activities that the board would be engaged in and, and what they've done and that that I think would be fine. Uh, uh, it would be, a, so the, the board makes recommendations to council, um, yeah, to the city council and city departments and then the council would respond to the board, here's what we did with your recommendation. And, and that that's up to the council if you want to make that amendment, but I, I think that would be okay. That would not be a, a substantive change. But there's two, there's two ways to do it, you can either uh, decide to to, to uh, pass that, and we'll do our best to draft the language. Well, three ways. Decide to do that, we'll do our best to draft the language based on what was said. Uh, that would be imprecise. I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, the second thing to do would be to continue the final consideration, and we'll try to come up with language for the amendment. Or the third thing is you don't make the amendment. But th those would be I, the I, options that you could, could have. Mr. Mayor? Yeah. I, I would be fine with that amendment. I'd suggest maybe... Council Member Shoemaker work with the city attorney so that when this comes back, we have language that meets. Uh, we, can, we can have that done meet, by the meets her meeting. her objectives, but mm -hmm. I, I have no problem with that change. Are we going to continue it until we see the changes? So I think the motion yes. would be I'll make continue. a motion to continue to draft those changes and to bring it back to the next council meeting for the third to the next meeting. That'd be fine. Cool. Perfect. Okay. I vote yes. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> You're welcome. Your Honor, that's seven yes. Motion carries. Okay, so we move to the next meeting on that one. Yeah. All right, that completes that part of the agenda. We're going to now move to the um, communications uh, and reports in. Uh, public speaking again uh, for those persons that are going to speak this evening uh, under the public speaking items of the agenda we will only be calling on those who have registered to speak all speakers must comply with our rules regarding their names addresses and they will not be or they won't be recognized to speak each of the five speakers this evening will receive two minutes to make their comments uh, keep your own time because at the end of two minutes the clerk's going to announce time and then the speaker's mic will be closed and we'll move immediately to the next speaker. We want to hear from all of our residents and we encourage residents to be respectful of each other uh, and their viewpoints, which may be different from your own. Uh, but while you may certainly disagree with that viewpoint, I remind you that everyone uh, of our council rules uh, provide that uh, comments that are slanderous uh, will result in that speaker being barred from further comments. As a presiding officer, I will determine whether the comments are slanders or not, a fair and warning. Uh, arguing uh, about the, those determinations on any matter is not permitted, and doing so will be considered disruptive and result in that speaker being barred from further comments and being required to leave. But at any rate, uh, let's move on. Our first speaker this evening is Adam Callanan. Hello, my name is Adam Callanan, Ward 3. Um, first off, I want to talk about the people that are being excluded from these meetings. Um, first off, with no hybrid option, anybody who currently has COVID, anybody who's been exposed to COVID, or anybody that's at increased risk of COVID just cannot speak in these meetings. I think that's unacceptable. We've been in this pandemic for a long, long time, 
and excluding that many people, especially during this wave, is not just like unacceptable and bad, it's also dangerous because we need to be hearing from the people that are most at risk right now and we're excluding them. Similarly, there's still an address requirement for speaking. Um, we have to file an address in the first place before you can speak and that includes a lot of houseless folks. We know that the city is targeting houseless folks. They've selected around six camps during this winter, during a pandemic, and there's also no winter shelter. So again, city is excluding certain people from these meetings that really um, need to be heard, need to be worked with, not worked against. I also want to talk about COVID in general. Um, there are no items, at least directly related to COVID on this agenda. Um, meanwhile, we're speeding developments, doing other things, some stuff that is good, like opening new public parks, but it's unacceptable that we're doing all that and not putting some of that on hold to actually take some action on COVID while we're in this, especially this huge wave right now. The city is still sitting on funds. It could be providing masks and tests to people, providing meals for people in quarantine, providing stimulus for workers or people who have to stay home, doing any kind of like mask mandate stuff. There's a lot of options we could do that's not exhaustive. Also had to talk about there was a human trafficking proclamation at the start of this meeting. Um, it was mentioned things made with forced labor. It was not mentioned that Iowa uses prison labor to just make a lot of things that are used in public buildings. Um, I don't know if that's true of City Hall. I don't know that many details, but I would hope that uh, City Council is thinking about the things that they use that are made with forced labor because um, I'm sure there are things that they use like that. I know a lot of the COVID tests are even made with forced labor. It's awful. Um, also, I want to talk about the fact that the city clerk has been for a long time now, but it's coming up again, blocking certain requests to speak. It's unacceptable. City clerk is making kind of arbitrary rules to block people. Right. <laughs> Taylor Weber. Uh, Taylor Weber. Uh, I, I want to acknowledge the first uh, council meeting with Indira. Uh, I appreciate uh, getting a voice, uh, not only a movement to speak on items I emailed in about, but then uh, hearing that uh, similar opinion and voice being given uh, that maybe doesn't align with everyone else. So I appreciate that first off the top. That's big. Um, second from that, uh, I had a bunch of prepared things and then some kind of craziness happened. And just in general, like we said how expensive bathrooms are, like three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000. You just spent that much money on a robot dog and some x-ray goggles to detect bombs. So like the priority is the problem, not the money. And so I would encourage us to continue to do those things uh, that actually improve our city and put the money in those places. So. The other big thing I think, uh, the bond threats have been going on in our community and, and we're not doing anything about it. We're spending more money with police, but that's just reactive. That doesn't solve the crime. Uh, and then a huge issue is it is very, very cold, like dangerously deadly cold. Uh, and we are doing nothing as a city to actually try and get these people into situations that they can thrive in and get themselves out of. Uh, if you say go to a warming center and you're talking about a mall or a library, that either isn't open in the evenings or isn't open on the weekends. That's not some place that someone can live and try and get up off their feet in this city. Uh, also, the crazy item of, hey, we're working with businesses to clear people out. Do you think people aren't just going to stand on the sidewalk? Like you closed the alley. You, you did, like, do you think you actually solved anything genuinely? Like just ask yourself that later. I don't think you did, but uh, that's OK. Uh, and I still got more time. It threw me off a bit. But I would just say echo the COVID issue. Like this is really big and problematic. People with accessibility concerns are risking their lives to come to a meeting like this just because they have a comorbidity, which is like all of us. So I would really uh, encourage us to actually try and move towards uh, hybrid and virtual options as much as we can. Bridget Peterson. Bridget Peterson, Ward 2, she, hers. Um, all I've been able to think about today is a photo I saw on social media. The photo was of a line of cars waiting to get into one of the only operational COVID testing sites in the county. Um, and the line was so long that police officers had to completely close off the street. This line of cars was at least half a mile long just to get tests in Des Moines, Iowa. And still we have no virtual option for meetings. Things are as worse, they're, they're worse now than they were in 2020 and you're doing even less about it. That makes no sense. Uh, when COVID tore through my workplace a couple weeks ago, my boss had to personally drive a rapid test to my house. Why is my boss doing your job in addition to her job? I've completely stopped drinking my tap water because I'm worried that filtering it is not enough to combat the volume of nitrates that I'm seeing in our water. 
I'm worried that if I get COVID, I will have to miss at least two weeks of work, which I absolutely cannot afford to do. I'm also worried that if I get COVID, I won't be able to get a hold of the necessary PCR test to ensure that I get insurance coverage in case I have long-term symptoms. I can't trust the rapid test because they are produced by prison labor under inhumane conditions. This causes the quality of the tests to suffer and often results in false negatives. I'm also incredibly concerned about how emboldened white supremacists have become in this city. I think about all the non-white people in my life. I care about them a lot, and I wish you did too, because uh, five of you aren't taking this seriously, and these are the lives of people I love. And lastly, it is not a crime to be houseless, and we shouldn't be so scared of them that we destroy their camps by the river, like DMPD has a disgusting habit of doing at the command of city manager Scott Sanders. If you actually talk to and get to know folks in those communities, you would actually see that they, um, you would see their humanity. Shame on anyone who furthers the idea that houseless people should be treated like criminals. Jolene Prescott. Jolene Prescott, um, Ward 2. Did I say that homeless people were criminals? No, did I say that? You know, you put that in my mouth. Okay, come on. Well, they go. shouldn't be able to lay on them. The thing is, I am being bullied here. Yes, I'm, I'm being bullied. And when that happens, we need to kick people out. Because that's the rule here. I had a legitimate concern. I need to be able to sit if somebody's laying on a bench then, you know what? I am being bullied. I am being bullied. Shame on this business here, because I, they're, they, they're very good at dishing it out, but they don't want to take it, do they? They're very good at dishing it out to others. Yeah. No, because I sat and listened to you. I sat and listened to you. Stop. Let her You're a bunch of bullies. You need to be quiet. Next speaker is John Noble. John Noble. Thanks, John. So after uh, uh, the bomb threat uh, that many of us have heard about that occurred at Burns United Methodist Church uh, on Sunday. Um, I and a few other folks here did get in touch with Reverend Dr. Thompson, who is the pastor of that church. And one of the things that she asked me to share was uh, the statement from uh, the Methodist Bishop um, of Iowa, uh, Bishop Lori Haller. Uh, Dear Iowa United Methodists, I am writing this afternoon following news of a bomb threat at Burns United Methodist Church in Des Moines. The threat is currently under investigation by local law enforcement. Burns United Methodist Church, a historically black church, is the oldest multicultural church in the state of Iowa and takes its name in honor of Francis Burns, the first black bishop of Episcopal Methodism. From its formation in 1866 by black residents, the congregation's ministries have focused on love of God, love of neighbor, and a commitment to justice, mercy, and outreach ministries. While we do not yet know the details of the bomb threat emailed to local law enforcement, this comes at a time when racially motivated hate crimes are on the rise locally and nationally. Racism has rightly been called America's original sin, sin that continues to breed acts and attitudes of, hatreds, of hatred. As Iowa's United Methodists respond to this morning's news, our efforts must be constantly led and accompanied by prayer, even as we work with people of faith and community leaders to engage in concrete action to dismantle hatred in its many forms. Bishop Haller also included a prayer after that that I'd encourage everyone here to read. But I do want to point to that last line, that we need community leaders who are willing to engage in concrete action to dismantle hatred in its many forms. If we want to be proactive and not reactive to these kinds of threats, we need community leaders who are ready to dismantle white supremacy and racism um, at, uh, in all of these ways. Um, that's what uh, Bishop Holler uh, has called on you all to do here. Um, that's what many folks have called on uh, city leaders to do. Um, Personally, I'm not confident that uh, many of you here are willing to take up that challenge. Um, I hope you will prove me wrong uh, and take this threat against uh, an, a cultural institution, a black culture. Natalie Harwood. Oh. Um, there we go. Yeah. 
There you go. Budgets are moral documents. The most accurate way to tell what a community values is by looking how they spend their money. Whenever the police department wants to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, it's considered such a foregone conclusion that it's on the consent agenda and doesn't even get public pop uh, comment, or isn't even moved within the community where they will be used. These tools have been used to kill in other communities like Dallas. The people of the Quad Cities deserve to have weighed in if those things are coming to their community. Meanwhile, in our own city, we can't even get funding for real warming centers for our houseless neighbors or for services for their camp communities. The city claims that malls and libraries can serve the purpose, but they aren't even open overnight. And just last year, one of our fellow citizens froze to death in a library lot. Just yesterday, an elderly woman was warming with her service animal and was thrown out of Jordan Creek Mall. I understand the police department murder robots are part of a grant program. But we always seem to have some bureaucratic excuse about why we can't spend, why we can spend for the police and can't for the vulnerable in our community. And at some point, our spending betrays our morals or lack thereof. All right, could we have a motion to receive and file the comments made by the public? Um, so moved. All right, receive and file. Moved. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposition? All comments are received and will be filed. Um, Mr. Mayor, as uh, pertains to Rule 41 of the Rules of Procedure, um, any council member may, at the end of a closed regular agenda, bring a matter not on the agenda to the council's attention. Council may act upon such matters as permitted by law or direct such matter to be included upon a later agenda. Um, I wanted to talk about the situation with um, the winter weather and unsheltered folks in this city. This Sunday, I went out to a couple of houseless camps and talked to residents specifically to see if the things we were told um, in our meeting with the Homeless Coordinating Council was being implemented or was successful in its implementation to get people off the streets in this cold weather. Um, what I heard from one resident, and this is a quote word for word, the rules and regulations they have down at CIS are worse than Polk County Jail. That is a concern that I have as uh, three out of six people that I talked to on one route said they would not go to CIS under any circumstances. Um, and all six said they haven't gone this week except to shower or eat. Um, as well, none of them told me that they had interacted with um, the street outreach team in any way. The street outreach team had not been out to see them, um, to offer them shelter at CIS, to let them know about the weather amnesty. Um, there were a lot of issues that I'm aware of and a lot of issues that I heard when I was speaking to houseless folks. Um, just the rules and regulations are too strict, but not only that, but that the staff members that they put in charge are uh, treating people at the shelter very poorly. No one had any complaints about anyone else at the shelter. They only had complaints about how they were treated by staff. Um, and some people were less harsh than others, saying that staff members they put in charge are just not well trained to handle situations, that there are a lot of people who have PTSD. Um, this person I was talking to is a veteran. Um, and that people, when they are used to isolating outside, the shift to being indoors in big crowds is extremely overwhelming. And there are not any like systems in place to deal with that. Um, there is a point of miscommunication potentially um, in that CIS has told us that they have had a storage unit for people to store their belongings for the last year, I believe is what I heard. Um, but that even last spring, um, as somebody brought a tent to somebody who was about to time out of the shelter at two days left, um, they were not allowed to bring that tent in um, by a manager. So I don't know if there's miscommunication between managers and um, the leadership at CIS or where that miscommunication is happening. Um, but we are hearing different stories um, from different people who have actually experienced being in the shelter. Um, this idea that is promoted in these conversations that if people are motivated, they're going to find housing through CIS, um, I think is short-sighted as there are people who are on waiting lists for housing for months and months and months, like nine months at a time. Um, but CIS doesn't allow you to stay that long. Uh, also, the issue that if you cannot, that if you're on Section 8, you can't also be on emergency housing. The issue that if you have a previous felony, it's much harder to find housing. And so this idea that motivation is the only factor that gets people out of the shelter and into housing versus out of the shelter and back onto the street, I think is faulty. Um, I also want to acknowledge the fact that when we say we can just put everybody in CIS for um, harsh weather conditions because they have their weather amnesty program, um, whether or not that is being upheld in the way that we've been communicated that it is, the weather amnesty program only allows people to sleep on chairs or sleep on the floor where they're being stepped on or being stepped over um, in the lobby area and that I believe 
as report from CIS, they are no longer on under capacity, they're over capacity. And so people are sleeping in the lobby. Um, and we could solve that by opening an actual winter shelter that has more space and is more spread out and has cots and is dealing with these things in harsh conditions. Um, Someone said to me that with the conditions in CIS, people just can't live like that, especially people who are used to having their independence. There is not like a, a sense of autonomy for people at CIS who are staying there. Um, and that is the reason a lot of people won't go there. Um, there's issues of resources. Uh, talk to somebody who had a cat um, and theoretically they could be sheltered by CIS, but they didn't have a cat carrier. So who's going to bring them a cat carrier um, to, so they can bring their cat in and, and be put through in that situation. Another issue that I heard um, was that the area that uh, the city is looking at not enforcing um, encroachment cleanups, um, it was described to me as a concentration field. That is extremely concerning to hear um, from somebody who is uh, sleeping outside, that they're not willing to go to um, the area that we are trying to say like is a testing site for if this is going to work, um, if we can stop enforcing encroachment cleanups and displacing people, that it feels like a concentration field. Um, an issue is that they chop down all the trees in that area, and there's no cover and there's no privacy and people don't want to be harassed. Um, the another, another issue was that it's too crowded and that people can't always live together in those situations. Um, and it was brought to my attention that sometimes there are domestic violence issues that people deal with and having one location where they can feel a stability of not being displaced um, means that they don't have an option to go somewhere else um, if they are in a dangerous situation with another camper. So just having that one area isn't working. Um, if we wanna see if this is gonna work, we would need to implement more and we would need to use consideration from the people who would be staying there as to what that would need to look like. Um, I think that covers generally everything that I wanted to bring up about this issue, but I do think that we need to move on this extremely quickly. Um, I think that one of the things we need to do is a simple thing of making sure that we do not do encroachment cleanups during a weather amnesty time um, because we don't want to be further displacing people. Uh, and I think that we need to make serious consideration of opening alternate um, shelter other than CIS because of the issues with people not being able to go there. And I would be willing to work with Polk County Emergency Management to discuss that further. Um, so that is something that I would like addressed soon, very soon. All right. We'll refer some of those on to the manager's office and uh, we'll- Can I have that directed to be included to... upon a later agenda? As per rule 41. Council may act upon such matters as permitted by law or direct like such matter. You can make a motion if, she, if, if you would like, you can make a motion to that effect. Uh, so could I make a motion for a special meeting or could I make a motion for? Well, you can make, you, you know, you can make a motion for a special meeting. You can make a motion to have the manager bring it back to a work session. I think uh, a work session would be because it sounds like a discussion rather than. A... Uh, there are some actions that we could take immediately. So I would like a special meeting this week. All right, we'll look at the manager's office, see if we can uh, schedule that and uh, bring in appropriate information that uh, would help us in that decision. All right. All right. Sorry, if it's a motion, is that something we vote on? Well, it, it, if the, the mayor can call the meeting on his own. Okay, so great. Otherwise the council Just wanted to clarify motion. that. So if the mayor right. calling the, the special meeting, then you can do that. Right. So that would we'll, include uh, Polk County Management and the Emergency Management and the Coordinating Council. That'd be great. Well, that's why we're going to refer to the uh, manager's office and see what resources we can bring Correct. to this and then come Since back there's up. already a consortium set up. So can I get a commitment to have a meeting this week? And we'll just figure out when that is. Well, we got the manager out, so we'll do it as quickly as possible. All right. Thank you. All right. With that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all.